All right, so this is Todd Atkins, and I'm live from the Philippines. So we're in the tank top today in honor of the Philippines, hot weather and everything. And uh, I'm here with Derek Galanis, um, and we're going to begin the show today, and kind of wrapping up some of the UFC and also Spitz versus Crawford. And uh, before we start, I want to thank World of Fight Design. Um, you can uh, find them at uh, Instagram at live the number two fight design their sponsor of mine they make uh fight banners and gym banners and uh you know if you order one using my promo code which is todd atkins you can get twenty dollars off your order and uh derek i kind of want to let you start out i know you had some uh, kind of some passionate opinions about this maybe we could start out with uh i know the young Pereira fight was one you had kind of a big thing opinion on so i think i'd let you start with that yeah, I mean, look, uh, Todd, to me, uh, it was crystal clear that it was a robbery. You know, Jan won the vast majority of the fight. You know, he controlled it. Um, the stats looked very suspicious to me. However, I mean, I understand with stats that, you know, prayer closed round two real big. And maybe that, you know, a percentage of those stats came from that close in round two. I still don't think he won round two, um, but he did, you know, spend the last minute or so or 30 seconds beating on Jan. Um, but overall, you know, round by round, Jan won every one of that one of those rounds, in my view. And, you know, it, it's something they're kind of brushing under the rug. And worse than that, Todd, and what I've seen is. You know, Pereira follows a narrative, right? Like, I mean, the bottom line is they want him for the next vacant title shot, right? He, who he is and what he's done with Izzy and whatnot. Um, so, you know, the fans, like they did with Dana White with Nganu, are all sort of rallying behind, uh, you know, Pereira's decision win. And, you know, if somebody's objective about it, Pereira didn't win that fight. It wasn't even close. And so they're really virulent in like you know defending that decision for Pereira and I think it's exactly what you said with Dana you know they're following the narrative they're like oh this is what what the UFC is giving us and this is what we believe so yeah now kind of talk about I mean I know people were asking about damage you know they're kind of getting back to well damage is the primary scoring factor kind of, you know, maybe get back to that. And, uh, maybe in this case, it wasn't. So, so Todd, I, you know, I, you know, I have a lot of listeners on TikTok where you got me started, you know, so um, I will say this, you know, I've got some MMA judges that have chimed in and I don't pretend to know the intricacies. I've never taken a rep or a judging course, but I have watched combat sports my whole life. And as all these guys were saying, oh, the damage, the damage, we had a judge chime in, agree with me that Jan won and say, guys, damage isn't on our scoring metrics, right? That's, that's not effective aggression, octagon control, you know, the various metrics, but damage itself is not part of it. You know, you can't like, I know Jan had a bloody nose or something, uh, but that doesn't play into the factor of whether, you know, one lucky punch that may bloody someone's nose, that's that's not how you score. So that damage factor, you know, is out of there. It's just one more way they're looking for Pereira to have won that fight. And by the way, Todd, let me give you an example. I think if Brandon Moreno had been given, gifted that decision over Pantoja, the same amount of the crowd would come out and go, yeah, Brandon deserved that. He did more damage and Pantoja looked tired. The same thing they're saying about Jan. It doesn't mean Brandon won. And by the way, I, you know, I wanted Brandon to win, but he didn't win. You know, and I, I was not one way or the other with Jan or, or Pereira, but, you know, Pereira did not win that fight. So, yeah. Now, let me ask you about this. Like Adesanya was saying that, you know, Pereira got up and put his hands up in the air and Jan kind of stayed down and looked exhausted. And that influences the judges. What do you say about that? Listen, so anyone who's actually fought and, and learns this very quick, it is your appearance. If you look tired, the judges 
absolutely hate it. It is the number one metric to get something scored against you. I don't care if you're winning. If you look tired, they're going to penalize you. And that is exactly what happened with Jan. Now, look, in fairness to Jan, the man was controlling Pereira. How do you not get tired controlling an animal like that? And I sympathize with him, but too bad. And by the way, let me give you another example. Uh, Alexander Gustafson, when he was beating up John Jones, he would box away from him and then he would put his hands on his knees. When you put your hands on your knees, you are signaling to everyone there, whether you know it or not, I am tired. I'm taking a break. And that is part of the reason Gustafson, while outboxing Jones, lost that decision. You can't show you're visibly tired. And that was probably the biggest thing against Sean. Now, is that fair? No, it's not fair. But, you know, judges are human, right? They're going to judge based upon those kind of things. So I think much more than the damage, what, the, the bloody face or whatever was that, that tired look. And again, it's not a scoring metric, but guess what? It, 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 in fact, it is. Now, um, kind of, let me ask you about, like, how do you think this affects Jan going forward, having lost this decision? I think it destroys his career time. Um, and Jan suffers from something. You look, here's a little known fact. You know, Jan's a striker. Muay Thai was his original art. You know, I talked to his manager. He did a little wrestling, and, and BJJ came to – to Poland after the early 2000s, and it's really popular there now. But the bottom line is, I always thought Rock, Jan was a grappler. Why? Because he's a boring fighter, and and he grinds things out. It's one of the reasons he didn't get the decision. Um, he reminds me of like Jake Shields in the days before Dana cut him. You know, Dana gave him a million fights that were terrible for him, and Jake Jake kept winning. And finally, Dana found the magic number with Hector Lombard. But, like, you know, Danny didn't want Jake around. He lost one fight and he cut him. Um, Jan is similar to me. Maybe not on the, 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 the level of Jake, um, but certainly in that mold. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you about the main event. You know, uh, it's interesting to see uh, kind of like Gaethje get redemption of a Poirier in the rematch and win the way he did. Maybe talk about you know, it's a victory for Justin Gage. So, so Todd, I was in the Tuna, Texas, uh, in, 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 uh, no, yeah, I was in El Paso, um, and in prison when the first fight went on. And I got to tell you something, it was such an exciting, emotional fight that I was jumping up doing martial arts moves on the white car there. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, Gaethje was winning that entire fight. For four solid rounds, Poirier looked out. And then Poirier poured on the boxing, and he outgutted Gaethje and knocked him out. This time, you know, Gaethje finished the job before it got to those rounds, you know. And by the way, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the video I made. Uh, and for people, I, I don't know if they know. I can tell you this, time when I used to fight, if I was outmatched or overmatched, what I would do is I'd get in the clinch, and I'd rack someone on the back of the head. And I want to say this. 100% of the time, that much stronger, better individual was marginalized by that. Um, the way Gaethje's kick landed, it landed in the back of the head for Dustin Poirier. It's what I call scrambled eggs. When that happens, you're done. Is it legal? No, but guess what? The ref can't see it. They never know. Just like they never knew when I went in the clinch and I'd rack people in the back of the head, they didn't really pay attention either. So, yeah, um, very interestingly, that's exactly what, um, God, who is that super middleweight guy from Wales? The well, oh, Joe Calzaghi did to Bernard Hopkins. He hit him in the back of the head over and over and over again. The ref never said anything. And I think that that's what happened with Gaethje's knockout of Poirier. He hit him in that sweet spot, man. Yeah, and, you know, it was an interesting combination where he threw a right and then a kick right after. You know, one thing I was telling somebody on the live is that a lot of people are probably going to try to mimic that technique now. So, Todd, I've been doing that technique for 15 years, man. You know, like, I've got good kicks. I'm a Tung Shido guy. You start a punch, right? And then they, they start slipping to that for that punch, and they land right into your kick right after that. By the way, the only time that Nate Diaz has truly been knocked out was against Josh Thompson. Same exact kick, San Jose, the night Gil fought Hendo. Um, he threw that straight right. 
Diaz, because he's a boxer, slipped left to slip the right hand, and he slipped right into Josh Thompson's right high kick. Um, it's a beautiful combo, man. I love setups that way. Now, what would be the alternative, you think, if, if Poirier had tried to avoid it? You know, how could he have avoided it successfully? Okay, so now you're talking about styles in MMA, and I like that. So, so here's the thing, Todd. You know, if you're in a, a Muay Thai fighter, especially kickboxing is a little different, but if you're Muay Thai, your head does not move off that line. Why? Because you're in danger of kicks and you're in danger of knees. So you never slip and roll. Uh, boxers, as we know, the majority of them, they slip, they roll in, they roll out, they, they bob and weave. They've got that head movement all the time. MMA is a, is a combination of the two. And what Gaethje had success with, just like Josh Thompson is, is tricking a boxing centric fighter like Poirier into doing boxing defensive moves in an MMA fight where they can kick him. And if you can time those, you get them. And by the way, that's exactly what Leon Edwards did to Usman the first time. So yeah, it's, it's wonderfully used. Me personally, buddy, I, I never had a lot of head movement, mainly because I'm too blocky. So I was never in danger of that. I'm not slipping anything anyway. Um, but for those slick guys, it puts them in danger. Now, I want to ask you about another one of the other fights that didn't happen, which was uh, Stephen Thompson and uh, Michael Pahea. And, you know, the UFC still hasn't paid Stephen Thompson. I kind of looked today and I didn't see any updates that he, they had. So I'm assuming that that still hasn't taken place. What do you think of that? And, you know, just overall. I think that Stephen Thompson made a very smart decision. You know, people really don't understand the fight is not in the ring or the cage. The fight is on the scales and how ready you can come in after being dehydrated and everything else. And, and Wonder Boy made the decision, hey, I'm not going to fight a guy at 174 pounds because he's got too big an advantage. The advantages in fighting are minuscule. You know, a good diet will give you a minuscule advantage. Um, uh, steroids will give you a minuscule advantage. And so you're constantly fighting these small advantages. And you can't give away advantages like that. I'll tell you a guy who did, Matt Hughes, gave away that advantage to Thiago Silva if I, or Thiago Alves. If I remember correctly, I think they were fighting in England. And Thiago came in. He looked like, he looked like a light heavyweight. And he destroyed Hughes. And Hughes, you know, Hughes took the fight like a man, like, yeah, I'll do it. Who cares? Give me money. You're like, and that's nice. But if you're looking out for your career, you can't do that stuff. Maybe in Matt Hughes days, it was worthwhile. He got paid a couple hundred thousand and, and that's what he needed. Um, but now where everybody's jockeying for title shots and, you know, Stephen Thompson's right there. I think he made the right decision. You know, that guy's got to suffer like you. He's got to make weight. Otherwise, you're giving him an unfair ministerial advantage. Right. And what about, what do you think about the UFC not paying them? I think that Dana has shown himself to be a very greedy guy. I think the way he's treated Nganu, the way he tr treated Melendez, I've talked about a lot when, you know, he's trying to sign him over from strike force. I think he's a greedy guy and um, he does petty things like that. Um, you know, Dana, and Dana can do whatever he wants. You know, he gets backstage bonuses all the time. Not paying Stephen Wonderboy Thompson for showing up and being ready to fight uh, is, to me, wrong. But maybe Dana's thinking, like, if I do that, then other people will decide not to fight if people don't make weight. Well, if people don't make weight, there shouldn't be a fight. You know, I remember when I was still in my kickboxing career, I was big on making weight. And my trainer, one of my many trainers, looked at me at the time and goes, Derek, why do you care there's going to be a fight anyway? And I didn't understand it because in high school wrestling, you didn't make weight. Guess what? You're not rolling. Um, and I was thinking of kickboxing like that, but the kickboxing, the low level professional kickboxing I was involved in, they had to have a fight. They sold tickets. There's a crowd. So they needed to, they don't need to in the UFC. I mean, maybe they feel that maybe they wanted Wonder Boy on the, on the card, but there's always other people they can put there. So, yeah, it's just apples and oranges with that, man. But I mean, it's it's called show money for a reason. There's no fight involved in the show money. 
So since when do you not pay a guy for that? Dana, Dana is an interesting character. Let's see what he does. You know, Dana may, and, and I remember about 10 years ago, it was different. Dana may have had his fill of Wonder Boy. You know, he's come real close. He had those close fights with Tyrone Woodley. Dana may, may be ready to move on from the Wonder Boy narrative. Um, and because Dana gets sick of people. You know, he got sick of Jake Shields. He got sick of Cyborg. You know, and when he's when he's done with you, he's done with you. Uh, I think it's unfair, but, you know, like, I get it. Like, it's it's like a soap opera, the UFC. And Wonder Boy's been around a long time now. You know, he's had his, whatever it is, eight years in the in the UFC. And, and it hasn't gone over for him. So for it to go over at this point, I don't know that Dana even wants that. Um, you know, the karate narrative is kind of played out. I don't know. We'll see. Now, before we get into Spence Crawford, I want to ask you about Diaz and uh, Jake Paul that's coming up this weekend. What do you think is going to happen there? So I, I think that Nate Diaz is going to be knocked out. Um, you know, uh, both judging by the way he looked in his last few fights. I'm not talking about Leon Edwards. Obviously, I'm talking about Kukui. Um, talking about, like, the way his brother showed up for Lawler gives me a hint, too. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, when I was up there, I told you, I got offered to spar in ATS three, four times, and I'd show up, and I was never allowed near him in that ring. He only sparred guys his own size. I've heard all those rumors that the Diaz brothers sparred with Andre Ward, and I just simply don't believe them. I think that was Bay Area guys supporting each other in a myth, in a lie, to like make themselves look better. Um, and Jake, Jake Paul is a big dude. Right. He doesn't look where he punches. I know he's not technically sound, but guess what? Those minuscule advantages, one gargantuan advantage is size and power. And by the way, it's one of the reasons those guys avoided me. I get it now. I didn't really understand it then. I was too big for him. I was too powerful. And, and that didn't wasn't their advantage. Nate, Nate, Nate is going into a fight he cannot win. So you don't you don't think there's any way he could wear Jake down in the later rounds? So so let's imagine this. Maybe Jake, maybe Jake Paul is t is finally tired of training and he doesn't want to train anymore and, and he's going to do that. Um, OK, maybe then I I'm going to treat it like Jake Paul is going to train just like train for everything else. Um, and my problem with that, although it's Diaz's most obvious way to win, my problem with it is Diaz has looked horrible lately. So I just I'm scared that he doesn't have that ability to do that anymore against a much larger man like that. But we're going to see, you know, Jake is relatively novice. Maybe he'll punch himself out over six rounds and Diaz will get a late KO. And that will be the only way Diaz will do it. There's no other way, uh, but I'm picking Jake Paul by knockout. Now, I want to ask you about Spence Crawford. Obviously, that was a huge fight. I think people were a little surprised by just how dominant Crawford was. Um, Tell me your thoughts on that fight. Well, first of all, look, there's a million excuses, and, and I get it. We didn't see the Spence we wanted to see, but you can't take away from Crawford what he did. You know, very clearly, he just became the number one pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world. Spence was an enormous challenge for him, and he passed it with flying colors. What, he lost the first round and nothing else? So the bottom line is you got to give all, all credit to uh, Terrence Crawford. And by the way, just like Floyd Mayweather did when he left Bob Arum and he took on De La Hoya and he said, I'm going for it. And if I lose, my, my career is over. But if I win, I can build a brand. That's where Terrence Crawford is. He left Bob Arum too, just like you know, Mayweather did. And, and he's about to build his brand. I hope he becomes fabulously wealthy. You know, he stayed in Omaha, even though everyone laughed at him. Um, the greatest part about combat sports for me, though, is, you know, places like Omaha and where's the where's Dante Wilder from somewhere in Alabama, right? Like the, these places can, they, can turn out world class fighters just like, you know, hotbeds like, you know, what California or New York. So um, awesome for him. Spence, I don't know where he goes now. Uh, I, he's got to get out of the weight class for sure. He was very drained. Um, but yeah, man, uh, we got a new pound for pound king and, you know, all Harold, Terrence Crawford. Now, it looks like maybe, maybe Ennis gets the next shot. What, what do you think that fight would look like? 
Well, you know, I, I noticed that for the last couple of years, people have been saying Spence and Crawford are scared of Ennis and this and that. But what they're saying now, after they saw Crawford dismantle Spence, is, well, I, I think he's going to be able to do that to Ennis too. So everybody's taking a step back with the way Crawford fought Spence. Um, you know, and if Spence wasn't compromised, and I don't know if he was or wasn't, but if that was top near Spence, if that was the Spence that beat Sean Porter, if that was the Spence that beat Ugas, if that was the Spence that beat uh, Danny Garcia and, and Mikey Garcia, well, I'll tell you what, then, then Ennis is going to be in trouble. Um, but, you know, we're not going to know until we see the Ennis and uh, Crawford in the ring today together. But it just goes to show what you were talking about earlier with um, Michael Pahea and Stephen Thompson, where you're talking about maybe Spence being drained and how the little things can add to one big advantage. Yeah, I mean, Todd, so so an interesting, you're talking about minuscule advantages like that. Absolutely. Maybe that was what it was. I, I just don't want to be, I don't want to be firm in that because I don't want to take away from what Crawford did. You know, the man's undefeated. He's a three division champion, two, two division undisputed champion. Now um, I, I can't throw that at Spence and, and, you know, and give Crawford because listen, Spence should have made the weight properly. If he didn't, that's on him. Now, I want to ask you about, um, there's one other thing I want to talk about, which was I saw today that Amanda Serrano signed with PFL for their Super Fight division. Do you think that's that's a big signing for PFL, and what do you think about that? Well, I think that Jake Paul has had a controlling influence in Amanda's career, right? And so now she's where Jake Paul is, where Nganu is. Listen, man, I you and I have talked about it, like, PFL has been talking about how world-class they are for so long, and we really can't see the fan base or anything else. But listen, if they go by Bellator, they may be building that conglomerate that can actually compete with the UFC. If they can become the FIFA of MMA, I couldn't be happier, uh, partly because the UFC has become very controlled. Um, and the Pereira victory was was reflective of that, right? Like they didn't want Jan to win. So suddenly Pereira moves on and he's going to get the title shot. It, it, in that sense, to me, it becomes like professional wrestling. Um, and I don't, and I'm not, I'm not appreciative of that. I like, if it's fighting, I want it to be fighting and, and the better man wins. And the better man on that night was Jan. So if PFL can do a better version of that, I'd be happy. I tell you, Bellator in the tournament days with B Bjorn Rebney was doing a better job of that. It was, hey, you know, the, the guy you expected to win never won in Bellator. And I think that hurt them with the fans at the time. But the reality is that's the way the fights got, the, 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 the sports got to go for it to be uh, long, long, uh, long term popular. And by the way, I, I make no mention of Endeavor, you know, combining the UFC and WWE in the same uh, same company. It's, it's a little like the wink and the nod, like they're the same sort of business. Now, I'm not making a global statement, but I will say the narratives in the UFC and what Dana is promoting seem to carry the day. Yeah, even if McGregor gets the fight with, uh, with uh, Gaethje. It would be more of the same. Yeah, by the way, on that note, Todd, you know what I really want to see? I don't think he'd win, but guess what? I don't think he'd win against Gaethje either. Why not have McGregor fight Leon Edwards in England? You know, this Irish English bash, like what and, and it's for three titles. I don't think anyone's fought for three titles before the UFC, right? Like, what why not have that fight? I mean, at the end of the day, McGregor's basically done. He's at the end. He's going to lose to almost anyone. So why not have to lose to Leon Edwards trying to make history? Yeah, I think he should fight like Patty Pimblett. Patty Pimblett? Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't listen. That, that, that fight he might be able to win. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. He might have a shot at him. So. Um, but if Patty wins, it, it elevates it. 
So, you know, about McGregor, now that we're talking about it, I mean, the thing with him, Todd, is this. He does really well when he rolls over people, right? He's, he's got aggressive, aggressive, aggressive. And when he was at lighter weights, I noticed about him that he kept on it for long term, like Chad Mendez. Like, Mendez took him down, and he got back up, and he continued, and he kept doing it, you know. And when he rolls over people like he did Poirier the first time, or he did Cerrone, or he did Aldo, he does really well. Where Connor does poorly is when someone stands up and is durable in front of him. And the higher you get in weight at Connor's size, people are just going to be durable. You're not going to be able to run over them. And that's that's the problems that Connor's been having. You know, him beating Eddie Alvarez, he got really lucky. You know, like Alvarez beat Dos Anjos, and Alvarez was the perfect matchup for Connor, you know, a guy that he could steamroll striking wise. Um, but you know, Connor trying to take on these bigger guys like Gaethje and whatnot in, in, you know, stand up bouts, it's going to end like Poirier, maybe not with a broken leg, but you know, maybe with a knockout, you know. Now, um, when we wrap up this, I wanted you to talk about, you know, where people can find you and also about your books and maybe a little bit about this Hunter Biden laptop, Devin Archer thing, since you're kind of close to that and it's a story that's building. Yeah, sure. So, uh, look, guys, my books, I have two books, a crime book at, uh, excuse me, crime book, Greed and Fear, the Galanis Crime Family. You can find it on Amazon. Hunter Biden's in it. Uh, it's all about my criminal family um, and our dealings with Hunter that the media has completely silenced. And by the way, Archer was on Tucker Carlson uh, yesterday. Did not mention the Galanis or the India Bod tribe at all. However, he is coming back. And, you know, it'll be really telling for me if they mention the Indian bond fraud, which they have to. I mean, Archer's going to jail over it um, and not mention my family. That would be very telling, even from Tucker. But, you know, we'll see what we'll see what they do, man. Um, if you guys like combat sports stuff, my book is Warrior of the Light, A Fighter's Journey Through the Rise of Mixed Martial Arts, also on Amazon. If you guys like my, uh, me talking about it, you can find me on Instagram with both at Derek Galanis or at TikTok for the crime at Derek Meyer Galanis, or at TikTok for the combat sports at Derek Galanis. Um, yeah, Todd, I'm I'm really waiting for Devin Archer's next interview with Tucker Carlson. I mean, listen, Tucker like is not with Fox anymore, right? He should be a little bit looser. So I imagine the 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 topic of the fraud and and the Galanis family will come up. <laughs> so we'll see. But what was the involvement with? Archer and Hunter Biden and Joe Biden and all of that. So, so my my family is an expert at ripping off investment advisors. Um, and one of the ways you can rip off investment advisors is you can buy them for pennies on the dollar. Um, why? Like, so a guy has a hundred million dollars in assets, but he only earns like a million dollars a year off that, right? Um, but listen, the Galanis family is interested in that $100 million in assets. We don't care what the, the advisor is making. You know, he might be a legitimate businessman. We're not. So you can buy a $100 million advisor for like two, three million bucks. Um, and that's the scam my brother put Archer and Hunter Biden together for. And they put it under the umbrella of Burnham, Burnham Financial. By the way, Burnham Financial, not without a sense of irony, was from Drexel Burnham. It was a spinoff of that original, you know, junk bond firm that Milken started. So they used Burnham Financial to try to buy investment advisors around the world. Now they had bought two, Hunter had raised money for, for, from the Chinese for, for $5 million to buy more. Um, Hunter had gotten paid. We had offices in New York. Devin Archer had covered for my brother on a couple stock sales. I mean, these guys were up to their gills in the fraud. Now, let me tell you the problem with it. Like every white collar defendant, Devin Archer doesn't think he's guilty. Well, I'm not guilty. I'm like, that's what all white collar guys do. Um, and so because he doesn't think he's guilty, he doesn't think Hunter's guilty, right? Because he can't accept his own guilt. The reality is, man, if they were regular citizens, they would be sitting in jail just like my brother and his co-defendants. But listen, we're, you know, we're not immune from corruption in the United States. Now, can they tie Joe Biden into any of this or not? Well, um, so how do I say this? Um, Hunter got the five million investment, 
right, from Bohai Harvest, which is essentially a, a Chinese firm. Um, you know, he got that investment by using his father's name. Hey, this money would be really important to the Biden family. Thank you. That was his MO with these people. He would get investment through through saying that. Now, does that tie Joe Biden in? Yeah, you know, it's it's the plausible deniability that they like to claim. Like, so was Joe Biden not involved in that? Okay, well, whatever. But what I find most uh most compelling, Todd, is nobody is talking about my family. They talk about the fraud a little because Archer's been convicted. In the 80s, my father was the Bernie Madoff. I mean, we were big news in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal every day. Now, mum is the word on who Hunter Biden was involved with. And I think that's that's just because the, the pub, public can't stand it. And by the way, it's not liberal media. It's conservative media, too. It's why I have a small hope Tucker will say something. He's not burdened by Fox anymore. Tucker could actually ask, so where did you meet Jason Galatis? And that might open up a whole can of worms that I've been waiting for since I got out of prison. But but we'll see, man. Maybe Tucker will cower down, too. Maybe Archer will tell him, I don't want to talk about Galanis. I, I don't know. All right. Well, Derek, it's great talking to you about some fights. I really wanted to do something. So then out here, so it's, it's good to take some time out and do that. And uh, yeah, it was great talking to you again. And great seeing you. Hey, how's the weather out there? Yeah, it's pretty humid, you know, and it's pretty rainy every day. You know, it, it rains a lot. Yeah. But it's nice. It's a, it's a nice little small place, quiet place. Small village. Okay. Quite nice. Kind of place you could retire to. I listen, me and my wife have planned on Tijuana, Mexico for a long time. I mean, I grew up in San Diego, so it's like my backyard. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it was great talking with you. And uh, until next time, man, appreciate it. And for okay, everybody take who care, brother. these shows, I appreciate the support. Everyone out there, check out Derek Galanis. And until next time, take care.